Now, despite appearances, this is actually a fully fledged PC that's been built from the ground up to look more like a sculpture or a work of art. As a result, it's got some really interesting design elements, like this rope that runs along the edges of this cantilevered central platform that houses the core of the computer itself. Now, we've also got some industrial looking heat sinks on the top and bottom here, and these do a great job of keeping the core components cool, all while making hardly any noise at all, which is quite an accomplishment um, because the components used in here are very powerful. And uh, in case you're wondering why there's two of them, we've got one for the graphics card and one for the processor. Now, it was a huge challenge to construct, but as a result, it's also very interesting to see how it was all done, which is essentially what this video is all about. So sit back and enjoy as I show you everything involved in making this thing from start to finish. Before we start, a big thanks must go out to these brands for helping to make this build happen. So the first thing to tackle for this build was the not so easy task of replacing the low profile graphics card heatsink with a tower cooler for the visual look of the final build, and also for quieter operation. The card I'm using here is a Zotac GTX 1080 Mini, which Zotac has very kindly provided for this build. It's one of the fastest cards you can buy, and should power through pretty much any game that's thrown at it. Unusually for such a powerful card, it's very short, which was essential for the build for aesthetic reasons. So after removing its heatsink, I could clean the thermal compound off the die and get it ready for the new tower cooler. The problem here though is that the original cooler spread out over the card, cooling other high heat components like the power delivery circuitry. To ensure that all these other regions are kept cool, I got a sheet of copper, which is a superb conductor of heat, and cut it down manually into some precisely measured cooling plates. To help transfer the heat around these, I'm also going to use a heat pipe. These contain a low pressure liquid and a wick and can rapidly transfer heat from one end to the other. It was pretty easy to bend into shape using a pipe bender, after which it could be mounted directly onto the smallest copper plate. Now these pieces are going to work in tandem with one of the best air-based CPU tower coolers you can buy, the Noctua NH-D15. I've always liked this kind of heatsink for its industrial look, and I want it exposed for visual effect. CPU air cooling doesn't get much better than this, so many thanks to Noctua for providing both of the coolers used in this build. So after unscrewing the original mounting hardware, I spread some thermal compound over the base and mounted it directly onto the largest of my copper plates, securing it tightly in place with some countersunk screws. As I want this plate to also cool the memory modules on the graphics card itself, I placed some blue thermal pads on top as they rest slightly lower than the GPU die. I then spread some new thermal compound over the die and screwed the whole plate down directly on top. I was a little concerned that having such a thick sheet of copper in between the die and the heatsink could harm cooling performance, but after testing this was proven to be a non-issue which I'll go into more detail about later. So now it's time to add the heat pipe plate, which was built to cool the voltage delivery circuitry as this area gets very toasty when the card is at full load. Now to thermally join these heat pipes to the tower cooler, I mounted the final copper plate on top with copious amounts of thermal compound between it and the heat pipes. This allows the heat pipes to dump their heat into the top of the cooler's base, which in turn would take up the heat through its own heat pipes and expel it through the fins. So with that, this one-of-a-kind graphics card was ready for business, and looks very serious if you ask me. After doing some testing, I did discover that the coils needed some extra cooling too, so I mounted an aluminium angle directly onto them so that their heat could be transferred directly to the heat pipes. The next thing to do was get some nice looking wood for building the case itself. 
and I ended up with some beautiful elm from a local joiner's workshop. The first piece I made with this was the platform for the graphics card, which is made out of three bits of elm joined together with aluminium bars. The reason it's in three pieces is so that it can fit tightly around the tower cooler, with the only gaps being for the heat pipes. So after placing some nuts and washers on the card to act as spacers, I slid the first wooden piece in between the heat pipes and screwed it securely to the topmost copper plate. The black stuff I've added around the heat pipes themselves is actually a black tack, which is there to make an airtight seal with the wood, the reason for which I'll go into more detail about later. Now I could add the first fan, which has been soft mounted with sponge inside an aluminium shroud, which should reduce any resonance that might get transferred into the wood. At this point all the aluminium bars could be screwed back in place too, allowing the front and back pieces to be mounted also. So with that done I could move on to making the central frame. This was made by bending a reasonably thick piece of aluminium sheet into shape and then drilling a lot of precisely positioned holes in it, as well as adding a couple of cutouts for certain ports. This could then be screwed tightly to the aluminium angles that run around the perimeter of the graphics card platform, and you can see that it's starting to come together. Now, in order to plug the graphics card into the motherboard, I had to use a 38cm extension cable for it. This is a good quality Lian Li cable, which has been very kindly provided by Overclockers UK. I was very grateful for this actually, as the cable is almost £70, so I'm super glad they came to my rescue. I plugged this into the graphics card using a little blue right angle adapter, so that the cable itself would come out vertically, and then plugged the power cable in also. So now it was time to make the platform for the motherboard. Again I used some aluminium for this, onto which I screwed some right angle brackets that had some threaded inserts added. These threaded inserts are something I've only just become aware of actually, and I wish I'd known about them before because they're just so useful. You do need a tool for them, and they work by being threaded onto its tip, after which they can be pulled and crimped inside a mounting hole. It's really nifty, so if you guys want to do this too, I've put a link to the tool in the description. With that done I also added some standoffs for the motherboard to later be mounted to, after which it could simply be dropped in place and secured reliably thanks to the threaded inserts. Now it was time to add the front facade. This again was made out of elm, and to get the beautiful curves I had to thicken the insides of the corners by gluing in some more elm layers to the inside. I could then take off the majority of this corner with a saw, and then use a plane to round it off, finalising it with some careful sanding. After I mounted it to the central frame, it was time to add the motherboard. The one I'm going to use is an ASUS Z370i, which is one of the best small format boards you can buy, which has been provided for this build by Rykelt, a link to which you can find in the description. As I wanted this to be a very high performance system, I've loaded it up with 32GB of RAM and an Intel i7-8700K 6-core processor, which I later managed to overclock to a very respectable 5GHz. As builds go, there really aren't very many compromises here, and it really is top tier performance. Now for storage, Western Digital has stepped up to the mark and provided something very special, which is a 2TB SSD in an M.2 form factor. This thing is incredible simply because of the sheer amount of data it can store, despite its tiny physical size. This is from their blue range of drives, and it doesn't cost as much as you might think, so I've put some links to it in the description. There's no need for any wires here, the drive just plugs directly into the motherboard underneath this heatsink and it's good to go. Now mounting the board itself was a bit of a squeeze due to the graphics card extension cable, but with a bit of coaxing I got it nice and secure and then proceeded to plug everything else in, like the on button, side USB ports and all of the power cables. Next I made a platform to cover all of this up. 
This one couldn't hug the heatsink so closely as the fan needs to move air over the motherboard itself to keep its various hotspots cool, but that's okay because it won't really be visible because it will be on the underside. As you can see, I've added an SD card reader to this as well, which is quite important to me as I offload a lot of data from my cameras this way. Once it was all screwed in place, I added yet another Noctua NHD15 to cool the processor. And once the fan had been added as well, that was the core of the computer completed, and at this point I was extremely curious to see how it would end up looking. Now as it's very heavy, I did need a good strong method of supporting it, so what I decided to do was cut out some large L shapes out of a sheet of plywood. As they're cut out of a solid piece, there's no join at the corners, making them very, very strong. And I even doubled up each pair by gluing and screwing them together, making them so rigid that there really was no give at all. So after adding plenty of right angle brackets to mount other pieces of wood onto later, I could then screw these supports directly to the central frame using some large bolts. With that done, the power supply, which is a 500 watt passively cooled fanless unit, could be mounted in between them, after which I added the rest of the ELM panels to cover everything up. Now at the back here, where all the connectors are, it's a bit of a mess, so what I did was get a sheet of aluminium onto which I mounted various ports that I wanted. This gives me pretty much all of the connectivity I need, save for perhaps the LAN port and monitor connections. I don't think I'll be using LAN as I did add a Wi-Fi antenna inside, but for the monitor connections I simply left a gap at the bottom for the wires to escape through. These can only be plugged in by removing the rear aluminium panel, which is a shame but I doubt that I'll need to access these often so it's not too much of a big deal. So to finish things off, I added some aluminium around the base and some wood up the sides. This left me finally with just these gaps to fill in, and what I used for this was some natural flax rope. This stuff is very rustic looking and I like it a lot. I simply glued each end together and wrapped around them with some thinner twine to hide the join, and then the whole loop could be pulled into the grooves. This looks really unique in my book, particularly for a PC. But as you can probably tell, there's still a piece missing at the bottom here, and that's because it's for a Burson Audio Play, a pure Class A headphone amp and DAC. This thing has been built squarely focused on sound quality for PC enthusiasts and gamers, and includes the ability to roll the op amps for tweaking the sound to your liking. I actually tried this out with three of Burson's own op amp sets, and was pleased to find that they each offered noticeably different sound characteristics, which I'll go into more detail about later. Now to the very base of the case, I mounted all of the connections that were required for the play, which means that it can simply be slid in place, completing the build. So with the PC now finished, how does it perform? Well, thanks to the powerful components, it can handle heavy workloads like 4K video editing perfectly, and also gaming. What's most remarkable about this is that it barely makes any noise at all in the process. This is hard to convey over a video, but here's an example recording taken with an ultra low noise microphone to give you a general idea. These low noise levels are thanks to the large heat sinks, particularly in the case of the graphics card, which sounded much louder with its original cooler. Here we can also see that the copper that sits between the dye and the heat sink doesn't affect temperatures much, 
as the die is roughly the same temperature as with the stock cooler, though at much quieter noise levels. Reducing noise was the purpose of that black tack that I added earlier by the way, as it makes the graphics card chamber airtight and so boxes in the fairly intense high pitch electrical whining generated by the card. Although typically referred to as coil whine, from my testing it appears to actually emanate from the MOSFETs, as I desoldered a coil and used a microphone to figure out where the sound was coming from. It's not unusual for a graphics card to sound like this, but it's usually masked by fan noise which is why it was important for me to reduce it as it became very apparent with a quieter cooler. By the way, although the bottom processor heatsink is technically upside down, it performs almost identically to it being upright as the heat pipes use internal wicks, so aren't affected much by orientation. So, with the PC having powerful graphics capabilities and processing power, it made sense to build in high-end audio too, which is where the Burson Play comes in. This is powerful enough to drive even the most demanding of headphones with practically zero distortion, which makes for a very pleasing overall sound quality that's noticeably smoother and more detailed than your average onboard audio. As I mentioned previously, the op amps can be easily swapped out and can even be used in various configurations to tweak the sound characteristics. These particular op amps are designed and manufactured by Burson Audio in Australia and can be used to upgrade other equipment too, like certain high-end PC sound cards. I settled for a set of Burson's V6 Classic op amps for their smooth sound reproduction, but I can always swap these out later if I want to change. Now one thing that some of you might be wondering is that, won't this get dusty? Uh, and the answer is yes, and essentially I'm just going to have to deal with um, the consequences of having to, you know, brush it every once in a while, uh, but I can also use some compressed air uh, just to, you know, keep it dust free. Um, but if I do that once a week, it should be uh, kept under control. Now before I go, um, I've gone over a million subscribers now, which is an absolutely fantastic number, and I've got to thank each and every one of you for subscribing, but as, as a result, uh, YouTube has actually sent me a little present in the post. So um, I've not opened this yet, but I thought I'd do it on camera um, so you can enjoy in the uh, celebrations as well. So let's have a look. It's big. Let's have a look then. Way! Now that is something special. Big thanks to each and every one of you who subscribed because you have made this happen. So thanks a lot and uh, I hope this is a good 1 million celebration video. So I hope you've enjoyed it and I'll see you next time. Goodbye for now.